All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Fantastic. So um, we're going to continue um, um, on our chapter on radical reactions. And we're going to start today uh, discussing a little bit the structure um, of um, and the reactivity, essentially, of alkyl radicals because those are the ones that are most interesting for us as um, organic chemists. So you'll find this in your book in chapter 25, um, 25 two, and this is a structure and stability of radicals. Structure and stability of alcohol radicals. All right, so generally speaking, the structure of an alkyl radical is very similar to that of a carbocation. So a simple, um, a simple alkyl radical adopts almost a planar, trigonal planar conformation, and you could call this essentially um, sp2 hybridized. So um, a simple alkyl radical like this, for example, um, houses the, the, the radical spin in a p orbital and all the other substituents are essentially um, aligned in a trigonal planar conformation um, around uh, this central carbon atom. So they are in a first approximation almost um, sp2 hybridized. So very similar to uh, to carbocations, um, essentially, or what we've what we've learned about carbocations, similar to carbocations. Um, and uh, this, the 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 similarities extend um, far beyond just the simple uh, the simple sp2 or trigonal planar structure, but it follows the same trend that you would expect uh, for the for the stability of these um, radicals uh, that you expect from from the carbocation chemistry. So if you went through a, a table, so let's say stability of radicals. So if you went, for example, uh, compare, um, let's say a tertiary alkyl chloride, um, and what we're looking at is essentially the bond dissociation energy for this uh, carbon, um, carbon halogen bond that gives us some information of how stable uh, this, uh, this radical, the resulting radical is going to be. And we can um, make a table here, essentially down here, of bond dissociation energies. Uh, these are all in kilocalories per mole, so that's kind of the standard unit that we hear uh, that we use here. And a tertiary carbocation, a, a, a tertiary radical, essentially, tertiary carbon radical, um, has a bond dissociation energy of about um, 80 uh, kilocalories per mole. Now, if we compare this, for example, to a secondary so let's say we have like um, a chloride here. This would be a secondary. The bond association energy increases a little bit because the, the resulting radical is not as stabilized as this tertiary one. So this is about 8, 81 kilocalories per mole. If we have just a simple, let's say, a simple alkyl chain, so there would be a primary radical. This is about 82. Um, kilocalories per mole. And then uh, in, in this series, obviously, the highest one would be uh, the methyl radical. So if we have something like this, and we try to cleave this bond that is about 85 kilocalories per mole. Um, if we just go by the hybridization of these centers, so all of these were essentially SP, um, sp3 hybridized or tetrahedral, right? If we just go by the stability of the hybridization, um, we, can also, um, we can also build up a series um, that corresponds again to the stability of, um, of the carbocations. So generally speaking, stability, of hybridization um, the sp3 hybridized um, uh, 
uh, radicals are more stable, or the, the SP, SP3 radicals coming from SP3 hybridized centers uh, are more stable than the ones coming from um, SP2 hybridized, and the one, those are more stable than the ones from um, SP hybridized. So that means essentially, if we look at this, um, if we had ever a radical, for example, at an SP2 center, so this is SP2 hybridized, those tend to be very unstable. And they are even more unstable, uh, uh, the, the, the even more unstable ones would be, for example, the ones that have a radical at an SP hybridized carbon atom. So if you have something like this, right? So the stability uh, uh, goes essentially along the same scale uh, that we expected for, um, for the carbocations. So, unstable, and we can say very unstable here. All right, but there are trends that, that are again analogous to, to what we have seen for uh, carbocations uh, that can increase the stability um, of a radical. And we mentioned this already a little bit when we were talking about allylic radicals. And this is um, a conjugation. So radicals stabilized by conjugation. So if we have, for example, um, something like this, the um, the bond, uh, well, the, the, if, we, if we were to break this bond homolytically, the CH bond, we can draw the arrows as these fish hook arrows out like this. And um, if we then go uh, to, the, to the product of this, this would be an allyl radical um, plus essentially uh, a hydrogen radical. And we know that this allyl radical, um, we can draw essentially a resonance structure for this, where you basically have these two possible resonance structures that contribute um, to the overall structure of the allyl radical. And that is essentially an additional resonance stabilization that um, lowers the energy of this, um, this primary alkyl radical. So resonance, Stabilization of primary radical. So this allylic system does not always have to be just, just a double bond, but it could be a conjugated system. Or analogously, if you think about this, uh, you could also think about radicals in the benzylic position next to an aromatic ring. Uh, they experience basically the same stabilization through the extended pi system um, uh, that they can be in conjugation with in the aromatic ring. So they are also analytically um, stabilized. Now, having uh, introduced a little bit about the stability, we want to start talking about the elementary uh, reaction steps that we expect um, with, uh, with radicals. And um, they are essentially um, a series of fundamental steps that you'll see over and over again in, in radical chemistry in different combinations and depending on the order in which these steps take place, you get different um, product distributions out of it. But we wanna start uh, very simply first by introducing the elementary reaction steps. So uh, 25.3, and this is a common um, elementary reactions. So um, let's take Roman num uh, numbering here. Um, the first one that we want to look at is the simple radical recombination. So that means that um, I, I'm going to have like two radicals floating around um, in, in solution and they can recombine uh, to form basically a, a closed shell species. So let's say we have like, a, let's say simply a methyl radical here. 
And uh, we have floating around somewhere a hydrogen radical. And I can draw now these fish hook arrows. And uh, these would form then um, methane, right? So recombine and annihilate two radicals. And this is a very favorable um, reaction. So the energy that you release is all the energy that you would have to spend to break this bond homolytically. So we're in the range of, let's say, 80 to, 80 to, uh, to 100 kilocalories per mole, which is a huge amount of energy that would be released, right? So this is very favorable. Um, as a reaction. Now, um, the, the second uh, type of uh, reactivity that we, wanted, uh, that we want to discuss here is uh, the bimolecular homolytic substitution. So, bimolecular homolytic substitution. And usually this is abbreviated again as um, SH2 type um, of reaction. Now, the characteristic thing for these radical reactions is that usually, uh, especially for the substitutions, you always have to write essentially two equations that uh, occur in parallel throughout the reaction medium um, to, describe, um, to describe this um, reactivity. So, um, we, we're going to combine them right now in just a simple step before we actually talk about the mechanistic details of that. But uh, formally, you can think about this as like um, you have a radical here, for example, and then um, just as a simple example, we can pick like, uh, let's say we have um, a chlorine uh, molecule. Um, and we can draw now, so we only have one radical on this side, and this radical will abstract one of the chlorine atoms from this, uh, this Cl2 molecule. So we would have to draw essentially the arrow a little bit like this, and then we can draw one of these electrons of the bond over to form the new carbon chlorine bond, and the residual electron will move over and form a, um, a, chlorine, um, a chlorine radical, right? Um, and uh, the product of this obviously is going to generate a new radical now localized on the chlorine and will form a closed shell molecule of this original, um, original uh, carbon radical, right? So we can draw our um, methyl chloride here. So this is our closed shell species now, and we transfer the radical um, to, um, to a chlorine now. Now, in order for this reaction uh, to proceed and to go on, now what we need is basically um, uh, uh, the starting material again. In this case, we have um, methane um, that we want to chlorinate. And we react this now, the closed shell molecule, with the chlorine radical that we generated on this side. And this is going to abstract now a hydrogen. So you can draw the arrows again. So let's say one fish hook arrow goes back to the, um, to the carbon, one fish hook arrow goes out to the chlorine, and the radical from the chlorine recombines with that. So what you generate then is basically a carbon-centered radical again, plus a closed shell molecule, in this case, this is HCl, HCl, right? Um, now, formally, when you start combining um, these two reactions occurring at the same time in the same vessel together, uh, the net reaction uh, that, you're essentially, uh, that you're essentially performing, just draw a line underneath this, is um, basically the chlorination of methane. So you have methane plus chlorine gas, and that reacts then to um, methyl chloride plus H.
CL. But this is basically kind of a daisy chain mechanism where one side of the reaction, um, the methyl radical abstracts a chloride from, the, uh, from CL2, and on the other side, basically, the resulting uh, chloride radical abstracts a hydrogen from, um, from the methane. And this basically, uh, this, this reaction goes forth and back between these two uh, continuously, and in the process turns over the entire reaction to chlorinate essentially one molecule of um, methane to form methyl chloride and um, HCl as, um, as a side product. Now, um, this reaction, formally this reaction is not just something that is done on an industrial scale process, but you, uh, you see this reaction, these radical type reactions also happening um, in biology, you might be a little bit surprised about this, but it's the underlying process um, for the uh, cytochrome P450 ox oxygenase. So um, radicals in biology, and we can say here cytochrome P450 oxygenase. So the underlying mechanism that we just described is exactly the same thing that happens here. Um, this uh, cytochrome P450 is, uh, is an iron porphyrin complex. So you have iron, and then I'm just going to abbreviate the porphyrin around it. Um, I'm not going to draw this out. Um, so this is your, your porphyrin macrocycle, and you start out uh, with an iron oxide. Um, um, oxygen species, so as a double bond um, with the oxygen here. And uh, this, uh, in, uh, in cytochrome P450 ox oxygenase, this is the, the cofactor essentially that, um, that helps the oxidation of um, benzylic position. So if you have, for example, and we're just going to pick a simple, um, it's not necessarily biologically relevant, but um, it illustrates the comp context. Uh, let's just sit, pick a simple. Um, Toluene, not toluene, for example. Let's do toluene. That's easier. Okay. So the way this works now is that you have a radical process where you have the abstraction of one of these benzylic um, hydrogen atoms by this um, uh, P450 um, oxygenase. And uh, the way this works, you can you can basically draw the arrows as uh, Fischl arrows out here. And this returns to so here, and uh, and one of these uh, one of these electrons basically goes back to 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 the iron. So that's basically a, a redox reaction on the iron. Um, that leads uh, to a benzylic radical. So we talked about this before. This is uh, this is essentially the same uh, allylic stabilization through resonance that we talked uh, about with the allyl uh, radical. And down here uh, with the cytochrome P450, you still have your iron complex, uh, and now you have an oxygen, and this is attached now to a hydrogen, and we can draw in the residual nitrogens here. And, um, now you have transferred now the, the radical to the, uh, to the um, carbon-centered species. And this again can now abstract, um, or this can basically now abstract this, this oxygen from cytochrome P450. And you can draw the arrows like, how do, yeah, let's do this this way. And um, one fish hook arrow from here and another arrow basically down to the iron. So the iron changes essentially its oxidation state by two as part of this process. Um, and you end up then here with uh, the alcohol and down here with um, your deoxygenated um, iron complex. And this will be re-oxidized and uh, enter the cycle um, at the beginning again. Now, this is, this is one key aspect, for example, to make some of these uh, very hydrophobic um, aromatic hydrocarbons soluble. So this is part, for example, of uh, degradation 
um, in, in biological systems so that these molecules can be excreted um, from, from, from the bloodstream. But uh, the mechanism, the underlying mechanism that is described here is exactly the same mechanism that we as chemists perform on a, on a, on a significantly larger scale when we do, for example, chlorination um, of, of hydrocarbons. So the, radical, the, the underlying radical steps are exactly the same. All right, so um, another type of reactivity, so this was the substitution that we've been talking about here. Um, another type of reactivity that you observe with radicals is the addition to alkenes and alkynes. So um, let's say radical addition to alkenes and alkynes. Now, let's pick another radical here. Uh, in this case, let's say we have um, a bromine radical and we uh, react this with a simple um, electron-rich olefin. Um, let's see, let's do something like that. So it's a, a tetra-substituted um, uh, cyclohexene. Uh, in this case, uh, feature-wise, this, this, uh, this bromine radical appears as electron-poor and this as electron rich. But we are still not drawing like the, the classical two electron arrows here because all of these are still um, um, defined as radical reactions. So if we were to draw the mechanism here, we could draw, for example, a fish hook arrow from here and we take one electron out of this double bond and move it over here to pair up um, with the electron coming from, from the bromine radical. And then we have one electron left here in this double bond that we can push over um, to, uh, to this, uh, this carbon atom. So it's gonna be an open shell molecule um, that we're going to get out of this. So um, this case here, we're going to have uh, uh, um, a tertiary, uh, carbon-centered radical that's relatively um, stable. And then we're going to have the bromine and uh, the other methyl group um, on, uh, on the other side. Of course, this can now go on further react. So you can imagine that this is either going to extract the hydrogen from somewhere, maybe the solvent, or it can go on and basically fragment um, uh, another BR2 molecule to generate basically the, uh, the, the dibrominated um, product. Um, so this reaction is essentially not terminated at this stage. This is not the end product, but this will go on um, reacting as we have generated a new radical. So uh, let's say new bond, new C, BR bond, and new radical. Um, the same works, all, of course, with, with triple bonds. So if you have like a toline, um, for example, something like this, and you react it uh, with a sulfur-centered radical, just to mix it up a little bit. So this is something like this, and let's say we have another phenyl ring on here, then we can draw exactly the same thing. So this radical can react with one electron um, from this triple bond, and we have the other electron moving out um, to the other side. And as expected, um, the product is again an open shell um, species that will, uh, will react further. Phenyl, um, and then let's say we have Phenyl, S, phenyl, and we're going to have um, a radical. So what we formed here is a new um, carbon-sulfur bond and a new radical center. And this new radical center can activate uh, another molecule, abstract the hydrogen, or basically generate another um, um, equivalent um, of this. Now, one key question that we haven't uh, discussed so far is uh, how do you start uh, getting a radical reaction to go? Because it seems like it's self-sustaining 
because we have a radical on this side and on the other side of the reaction again we have a radical so this can regenerate another species this can go over and over again in a cyclic mode but how do you even start this you need some um, some molecule to basically facilitate this initial generation of a radical that kickstarts um, this, uh, this radical cascade. And there's a set of, um, set of uh, well-known molecules known uh, and used um, on, um, uh, in, in a chemical laboratory that are specifically designed to have a very weak bond that breaks under either light or heat and, um, and generates this initial radical that starts the, the, the radical reaction or the radical cascade. And um, we're gonna introduce some of these. So, um, um, rad, let's call this radical starters or radical initiators. And usually they rely on a, on a weak bond or the homolysis of a weak bond. Now, one that you'll, that you'll see um, uh, pretty commonly is benzoyl peroxide. So uh, the structure looks a little bit like this. You have two uh, benzoyl groups and they are basically linked by this peroxide linkage. And it looks a little bit like this. So this is benzoyl peroxide. And the weakest bond in the system is obviously this oxygen-oxygen bond uh, that you see here. The bond association energy for the system is just around um, 30 kilocalories per mole. So that's a pretty weak bond. And you don't need a lot basically to, to initiate the homolytic cleavage of this bond, where basically one radical goes over to this oxygen and one radical goes over to this other oxygen. So a simple um, heating or a little bit of light irradiation is enough to activate this molecule and uh, generate essentially two equivalents of the, um, of the benzoyl radical. So this is your benzoyl radical that you get. And this is usually not a long-lived species and very quickly decays into, uh, into, the, into the phenyl radical and uh, CO2. So uh, this can further fragment basically by good, uh, putting one electron over to the, to the aromatic ring and one electron over into this bond. You take this electron and move it over here. And then the, act, the actual species that you have as a radical initiator in the reaction mixture is then um, an aromatic ring with a radical. Uh, and uh, on the side, you have basically generated um, CO2 that bubbles out um, of the reaction mixture. So that's nice because this is kind of pretty much traceless. The only, uh, the only species that you have to deal with later is this, um, is this phenyl um, radical that you um, that initiated um, your reaction. Now, uh, another common one is uh, N-bromosuccinamide. Um, that's, uh, that's actually oftentimes a dual role because it can also be used as, uh, as a reagent, not just as an initiator, um, but it's worthwhile discussing it here because it falls under this category of weak bonds. So this is N, Bromo succinimate. And usually you see this abbreviated as um, NBS over uh, reaction arrows. And uh, the bond uh, for this nitrogen uh, bromine bond is um, roughly uh, 46 kilocalories per mole. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit higher than um, um, the benzoyl peroxide. And um, what, but the advantage is in this case, uh, what you generate, this is often used in the context of uh, bromination reactions. You actually generate immediately um, the, the bromine radical that uh, is part of the, um, of the cascade of, for example, a radical bromination. So um, 
generate this stabilized radical um, plus BR as, um, as the free species. And usually this is hot enough to, to initiate um, the, um, the radical bromination, for example. Now, the last one um, that we want to introduce uh, looks, looks a little bit more exotic. And this is azo bis isobutyronitrile. So if I just see if we can draw this out. So N, N has nitriles at the ends, and then it has two alkyl groups, methyl groups usually um, attached to this. And this is called AIBN, usually abbreviated, but the full name is azo this isobutyro nitrile a i b n so anytime you see something like this a i b n or you see the benzoyl peroxide or nbs in a reaction uh, you should uh, you should pay attention to this and uh, and figure out whether you're dealing actually with a radical reaction so these are usually if something like this is written above the reaction arrow, there's a good chance that you're gonna be dealing um, with, with a radical reaction. Now this uh, um, can be activated by light, but more often it's just activated by heat. So if you just heat this up to about 50 degrees Celsius, um, this, uh, this molecule can decay uh, very rapidly. So um, you can imagine that the most stable species that you can form from this is dinitrogen. So one of these electrons of this nitrogen carbon bond uh, forms the triple bond from uh, dinitrogen. You get one from the other side too. And then basically these uh, residual uh, electrons go back to uh, these tertiary carbon atoms and are further stabilized by the nitrile group that is attached to them. So you end up with um, N2 that is a uh, gas uh, and escapes from the reaction mixture. And uh, on the other side, you have your, um, your nitrile that will start uh, the, the radical uh, chain reaction, right? So this is basically then your first radical um, that, uh, that initiates um, the, the bromination or the chlorination or um, the, the radical polymerization or something like that. All right, so now that we've talked about uh, the two types of reactions uh, that radicals undergo, so the substitution, the homolytic substitution, and the addition to double bonds, and we talked a little bit about uh, initiators that we need for all of these reactions to start the, to, to create this first seminal radical that, um, that sustains um, the, the reaction. I want to go into, uh, into one big scale industrial process that uses this chemistry um, in, in really, really large, uh, large scale. And this is essentially the radical halogenation of alkanes. So um, if we go into here, so this is, uh, I think in your book, that's 25, four, uh, radical halogenation. Um, of let's say alkanes. Um, and uh, we talked about uh, methane um, um, uh, chlorination previously as a simple example. Um, this time we're actually going to go into the, the full mechanism, every single step of the chlorination of cyclohexane. So the reaction that we're looking at um, as an example here is uh, the chlorination of hexane with uh, chlorine gas, so Cl2 and that um, reacts to uh, the, the chlorinated cyclohexane um, plus HCl as the side product. So even though this is basically the stoichiometric um, uh, um, reaction uh, that, 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 we're, that we're gonna study here, uh, the mechanism is a little bit more complex and involves a lot more um, individual steps. So let's talk about the mechanism. So um, as in many other reactions, we have to generate a first, um, a first radical. And this is usually what we call uh, the initiation reaction. Now on a large scale, uh, this is basically achieved by homolytically cleaving uh, 
uh, chlorine molecules uh, by, um, by light, essentially. So an intense light source is enough to cleave this and give them, gives them enough energy. So if we have chlorine um, uh, gas and uh, we just um, irradiate this, this is, for example, a UV lamp, we can break this bond here and generate essentially two uh, chlorine radicals uh, in situ. So this is CO plus CL. And usually we call this reaction the initiation because that's the only reaction in this entire scheme that we're going to discuss that actually generates new radicals um, as part of um, as part of this um, this reaction arrow. Now, what happens with these uh, with these chlorine um, um, radicals now that they are floating around in solution? Well, they meet one of those cyclohexanes and start reacting with it by abstracting um, a hydrogen. So, the next thing that is going to happen is you're going to have a chlorine radical that will react with a cyclohexane and it will abstract one of, these, uh, one of these hydrogens and leave behind basically HCl and a carbon-centered radical. So um, this is basically HCl plus cyclohexane radical. And you can call this, this, uh, this first step essentially the hydrogen abstraction, H abstraction. Uh, now this carbon-centered radical can now react with an excess of the uh, of the chlorine gas that floats around in solution. So let's let's draw this out. So Cl, Cl, and then we have our carbon-centered radical. So now this can abstract a chlorine from this which basically regenerates um, our chlorine radical and gives us uh, the chlorinated hydrocarbon. So Cl plus Cl radical. So what you'll see here is that as part of these two reactions, the position of the radical bounces forth and back between uh, the chlorine-centered radical and the carbon-centered radical. So a chlorine-centered radical gives a carbon-centered radical. This carbon-centered radical itself again reacts with, uh, with the chlorine molecule and gives back our, our original chlorine-centered radical that we threw in here. So this, this two, these two reactions basically occur in parallel and feed each other the starting material that they need to proceed. And this is why we call these two reactions here the propagation um, reaction or the propagation steps. So um, propagation. This is these two reactions. And the net result of these two reactions essentially is the, um, the, the formal reaction that I described um, up here. Now there's one last reaction that we need to, uh, to, need to account for in, in this system. And this is something that basically terminates the reaction. That's usually the thing that you want to avoid if you want to go to full completion. Um, but there are reactions that basically interfere with, um, with this beautiful um, um, forth and back cyclic um, transfer of radicals that you see in the propagation stage. And these are the termination reactions. And any termination reaction essentially annihilates um, radicals. And usually it annihilates two radicals um, at a time. So if you imagine like all the radical species that you have floating around here um, in, this, in this reaction mixture, any of these could coincidentally meet another radical species and recombine to form um, a closed shell uh, molecule. So you could start out, for example, with having um, two chlorine radicals finding each other in solution, recombining to form a chlorine gas again. So it's essentially the reverse reaction of this step here. So that would annihilate essentially two radicals 
that otherwise would take part in this, uh, in this chain reaction here. Now, of course, these are not the only possible termination reactions. You can have, of course, uh, two carbon-centered radicals recombining. So this gives a completely different product uh, than we had anticipated. So this gives essentially bis cyclohexane. Um, or the last one, of course, you can have a mixed recombination. You can find a radical that recombines uh, with a chlorine. And this also annihilates uh, one radical species each and slows down essentially or, or, or lowers the number of active species partaking in, um, in, this, uh, in this radical chain reaction. Now, there is a nice way to essentially illustrate uh, this, this sequence um, of reactions um, in, a, in a cyclic mode, very similar to how we displayed uh, the, the mechanisms of uh, transition metal catalyzed um, reactions. And I just want to show you this, that it might help kind of um, put all these uh, individual steps into a little bit of a, a, little bit of a bigger picture. So, um, let's say cyclic radical mechanism. So um, the key to that is essentially that uh, that we that we show this um, this transfer of the radical from a chlor uh, chlorine centered radical. So Cl here on this side, and on the other side we have the carbon centered radical. Um, that is basically on the, on the cyclohexane. Now, um, we said that we would start the reaction by bringing in uh, um, the, the radicals uh, through a homolysis of chlorine gas, so Cl, Cl, um, and we said that we can do this reaction um, just with light. Um, and this is basically our, um, our initiation step. So we generate radicals from chlorine by homolytically cleaving them. So this is initiation. Now we know that this, uh, this chlorine can now react um, with, uh, with cyclohexane um, to, uh, to give the, the carbon-centered radicals. So um, what I'm drawing right now is essentially the first step um, of the propagation reaction. And we know that what we have to feed in here is essentially cyclohexane. So cyclohexane goes in here and um, what we kick out of this reaction is, um, is essentially HCl. And uh, then we end up essentially with this, uh, with this carbon-centered radical. And this carbon-centered radical, again, um, as we have talked about before, can react with chlorine to generate essentially the chlorine-centered radical again. In order to do that, we basically have to um, add Cl2 here. And what we spit out is essentially the product that we're interested in this reaction. So the chlorinated hydrocarbon that comes out from the second step of the propagation reaction. So this in the center here, uh, let's pick green. We can call this a propagation. All right, so we have the initiation and the propagation um, process. Now, the only things that we still have to consider now are basically the steps that lead to the destruction of either of these radicals. And these are essentially recombinations of either one of these chlorines uh, with another one of these carbon-centered radicals or basically a dimerization of either um, of these species. So I'm just going to indicate this essentially with two arrows um, that take out um, this, uh, this reactive radical and are competing essentially with this propagation cycle as the termination reactions. So let's call this termination. And this would be the termination. So as long as the termination um, is slower than the propagation, we have a successful turnover uh, between these two radical species and we are producing um, the product of the reaction 
um, that, we are, uh, that we are interested in. If these termination reactions take over, then basically this reaction teeters out because less and less of this active radical is present in the reaction mixture. And at some point, basically all of these have recombined and the reaction dies at that point. Now it can be restarted again by basically just feeding in more of these radicals of either of these. This will reinitiate um, this process. But in order to do this, we either have to re, uh, um, split basically chlorine gas again or add one of the um, initiator molecules that we have discussed uh, just previously. And for example, heat it up to cleave a bond and to generate um, this, this initial um, radical concentration that, um, that takes part in this, in this propagation cycle. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit of the mechanism, um, I want to um, address some of the issues with the kinetics and the thermodynamics um, of radical reactions. And um, for this discussion, we are going to focus only essentially on the, on the halogenation reactions because those are the industrially most relevant um, processes uh, that, that, you will, um, that you will encounter. So um, let's talk about, uh, this is um, 25.4, uh, the kinetics and thermodynamics. And thermodynamics of um, this reaction. And we're just going to pick a simple example here. Um, let's say we take methane um, and we react this uh, with a halogen. And I'm just going to abbreviate this here as X2 um, under photochemical conditions. So um, we, we break this X2 uh, bond essentially with light and we generate the halogenated species plus HX. That's essentially the reaction um, that we're going to be looking at. And um, in order to kind of analyze this um, from, a, from a thermodynamic standpoint of view, again, the best way to do this is draw an energy diagram. This needs a lot of space this time. So we're going to do this over the entire, um, entire scale here. And let's say we call this um, delta E over here, and this is our reaction um, coordinate. Now I'm going to pick um, I'm going to pick a starting point here. Let's say we calibrate them all to our um, our starting material, and um, our starting material here is essentially the the X radical um, plus uh, methane um, plus uh, the halogen X2. And I will calibrate them all so that they are all with respect to uh, the starting material, no matter whether we are talking about the brominated species, the chlorinated species, the iodinated species, um, or the fluorinated species. So those are the kind of the four, um, four halogens that, um, that we're going to be looking at. And um, now let me quickly draw in the intermediate species where you have the carbon centered radical. So in the case, let's say, let's draw one here, then one over here, one here, and one here. And um, we're just going to go through those and, and label these. So this first one here is basically the process if we have an iodination. So we generate HI plus, um, the CH3 radical, um, and we basically still have I2 floating around. The next one, the next lower one is the brominated species, so HBr plus CH3 radical plus Br2. The next one is HCl plus CH3 radical plus Cl2, and the lowest one is HF plus CH3 radical plus F2. Um, and I'm going to pick a different color here. Um, so the, the transition state that these have to go through to get to these intermediates look a little bit like this. So this is the highest transition state. The next higher one is the 
is the brominated species, then we get the chlorinated. And for the fluorinated species, the barrier is very small. Looks something um, like this. And then uh, when we get to the, to the product, so this is the, basically the thermodynamic um, uh, final product of this reaction, uh, we can again draw like basically four of, these, um, four of these levels. So in the case of the fluorinated species, this is the lowest. Then, in the case, then we have um, the chlorinated species is lower than the starting material, so lower than the product, so it's an exothermal reaction. The brominated species is an exothermal reaction. And the iodinated species is the only one of these that is going to be endothermal. So the product here is basically HI um, plus CH3I plus the iodine radical. And here we have um, HBr plus CH3Br plus the bromine radical. We have HCl here plus CH3Cl plus Cl radical. And the last one here is HF plus CH3F plus the F radical. And now again, we can draw the, uh, the transition states that lead to these. So these products here, so this one goes up here and it's lower than the first one. This one goes up here, again, it's lower than the first transition state. This way, and the last one here, pay attention that I don't go too high here. Um, is again this activation barrier. Now, if you look overall at these um, at these reactions, so depending on uh, depending on the x, um, the delta H for the reaction uh, for each individual uh, for, for each of these, so the delta H um, not reaction for this for the iodination is plus 13 kilocalories per mole. So it's an endothermal reaction. It goes up in energy from the starting material. That's why iodinations are usually not done uh, in a radical process. For the bromination, um, the delta H not reaction is negative. So this is minus eight. For the chlorination, delta H not reaction is minus 24. And for the fluorination, the reaction is very exothermal. It's 102 kilocalories per mole down uh, in, in energy. Now, what essentially can we say about this then? Well, um, if we want to do a radical iodination, we're actually dealing with an endothermal reaction. So that is um, thermodynamically unfavorable. We're essentially going uphill towards, um, towards the products. For the bromination and the chlorination, both of these are exothermal and they are within a reasonable range. So the chlorination is easier, it's more exothermal. Um, than the bromination, but they are both within a range that sounds reasonable as, as, um, as a chemical synthesis. Um, the fluorination instead is, um, is a pretty violent reaction. Um, you see that the barrier that you have to overcome to get to this first intermediate and even from there to the products are pretty low and it's overall very, very exothermal. So a minus 102 kilocalories per mole is a huge release um, um, in energy. And uh, that means that in most cases, uh, if we look at fluorination reactions, these actually proceed explosively. So there is no way you can basically do a controlled fluorination with a radical process like this. But once you've generated this radical, the heat that you generated here by releasing that type of, that kind of energy here breaks more radicals. And basically this is like just a, 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 a chain reaction that they keep expanding and accelerating explosively. So fluorination reactions are nasty and usually not performed um, in this way. In fact, if you were to try to do a fluorination um, um, via this process, so I'll just give you, give you an example. Um, Attempt monofluorination 
if we try to do the same thing that we did, for example, with the chlorination, where we take cyclohexane and, um, and instead of using uh, chlorine gas, in this case, we use uh, fluorine gas in this, um, in this reaction. And we subject this to, uh, to initiating conditions that cleave this initial F2. What we get out of is, is an explosive reaction that generates the perfluorinated um, hydrocarbon. So all the hydrogens um, on this hydrocarbon will be replaced by fluorines in a, in a fastly accelerating reaction. So these are really, really hard to control and usually are not performed in a, in a research laboratory because they are just not safe reactions. Our EHNS standards prohibit us from, from, from doing this. Um, so usually you get perfluorination here. Now, um, let's see. Yeah, I have enough time to, to tell you a little story about this. Um, while, I was a, while I was a graduate student, um, we had one group in the department that was forced at some stage to use um, uh, fluorine gas uh, in, a, in a reaction. It was an inorganic reaction. It was not, they were not attempting to do something like that, so it was not super dangerous. Um, but still, they needed um, fluorine gas as, as a reagent for one of their transformations. And um, they set up the reaction in a fume hood, as you do with all the safety, um, safety equipment in place. And um, when they were ready, they basically opened the cylinder um, of, the, um, of the fluorine tank and bubbled slowly fluorine gas um, through the reaction mixture. And then the reaction took like three or four hours to, uh, to complete. And after that, as you would expect, you go back into the hood and you turn off the cylinder. Turns out that um, over these two or three hours, uh, the fluorine gas had corroded um, the, uh, the, the regulator valve that they used on the, on the cylinder and all the plastic gaskets within this, uh, within this regulator were completely shot and were basically have had undergone some form of this, um, of this reaction. So they were never able to close that tank again and having um, an increasing, an ever increasing amount of fluorine gas um, um, in your fume hood and pumping out into the lab is not a safe condition. So uh, they essentially pulled the fire alarm and evacuated the entire building. And the fire department had to come in with full protective gear and um, pack up the cylinder in a steel tank to prevent it from further venting um, and had to take it out. So we, we, were, um, we were out of the lab for several hours while they were kind of trying to figure out how to deal with the cylinder um, of fluorine gas. So this is just kind of like a, an illustrative example of um, how nasty um, these radical reactions these specifically these highly exothermal reactions with uh, fluorine gas um, can be. All right, so um, we talked about the thermodynamics. Um, now we want to talk a little bit about the, um, the selectivity of these reactions. And that's essentially related um, to, the, to the kinetics of these, um, these halogenations. And I just want to pick two examples here. So this is um, chapter, uh, what is this, 25? for, I think this is C, um, the selectivity of halogenations. Because so far we have never actually addressed the issue which of these hydrogens is actually gonna get abstracted. So if we compare two, um, two uh, um, reactions, so let's say we have, um, propane and we react this uh, in a chlorination reaction, so um, Cl2, and we generate the radicals um, with light, we get a reaction mixture. I'm not going to draw all the individual steps here. I'm just going to draw out like the, the reaction products that we isolate from that. We get about 60% um, of uh, the secondary chlorination and we get about 40% um, of the primary chlorination product. So we get about, this is 60% um, and this is about 40%. Um, so the, the secondary radical, as we might expect, um, is, uh, is preferred because it's the more stabilized radical that you're, that you're going to generate. But in a situation like this where we have two methyl groups, so you have essentially six hydrogen that you could extract on the, on the ends of this molecule and you have only two hydrogens that you have here in the, in the, 
in the secondary position, you still get a significant amount of this primary um, chlorination product. Now, if you do the same reaction um, with bromine, so Br2, and again, we shine light on this. This reaction is much more selective. So in this case, we get 99% of the secondary bromination product. So this is 99%. And only about 1% or the residual 1% of the primary um, uh, bromination product. All right. So it's interesting to see that just changing um, out the halogen, not changing the mechanism of this reaction at all, and not changing the starting material itself, um, there seems to be a selectivity preference um, for, uh, or the, the, the bromination seems to be much more selective um, than, uh, than the halogenation. And that's something that we want to look at a little bit closer in, um, in, in the context of um, where the selectivity essentially originates from. So if I just pull this down a little bit, so I can write here um, selectivity, let's move this over, um, selectivity of Cl radical versus the bromine radical. Now in order to understand this, we, we can look at the differences in the, in the transition state uh, energies for each of these reactions. So again, a higher transition state would cost you more to get through it. Um, uh, so it would be an unfavorable reaction. Um, a lower transition state energy would, uh, would, lead, to the, would lead to the favored um, product then. So let's look at these a little bit. And again, this is uh, the energy energy scale here. And let's say on this side, uh, we are going to do uh, the chlorination. Let's see, um, yeah, starting material, let's put it here. And on this side, we are going to do um, the, the bromination. So um, on this side, basically you have uh, our propane plus uh, the chlorine radical. And um, after the reaction, essentially, you have two possible, so if this reacts and abstracts a hydrogen, there's two possible intermediates that you can get out of this. One is basically the primary radical plus um, HCl. And uh, the other species that you can expect is the secondary radical. This, of course, lower in energy because it's more stabilized plus um, HCl. Now, the transition states that you have to get through is, uh, of course, higher for the primary. So if we go something like this, and then for the, for the secondary, the transition state looks a little bit like this. Now, something that we can say about these transition states now is that they are early transition states. So they appear early on the reaction coordinate and structurally they are similar to the starting material. So we can talk about early um, transition states and they're similar to the structure of um, the starting material. Right Now, this is the case for the, the chlorination reaction. Now, for the bromination reaction, this looks a little bit different. Um, we have, again, our um, propane here, plus, uh, in this case, we have a, um, a bromine radical. And um, the first step of this that basically transfers the, the radical to the, um, uh, to the carbon um, is an, an, an endothermal process for the bromination. So we have something... Uh, let's draw it out like this a little bit. Um, we have radical here plus HBr and over here plus H. We are. So again, we have the secondary and the primary. And the primary obviously is going to be higher um, in energy again. Um, and if we draw the transition states out for this one, this is going to be a late transition state. 
and it's going to be more similar to the products. And the difference in stability between the products is going to be the thing that determines um, the selectivity in this case. So this is a late transition state um, and it's similar to products. And what you can see very clearly here is that the difference in selectivity for the primary and the secondary um, halogenation product essentially depends on this difference in the, in the activation energy. So you have to overcome a significantly higher barrier if you want to go to the primary bromination or the primary radical here than you have to uh, do to get to, um, to the, the secondary one. In this case, so there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a higher selectivity in this case. And this was reflected in the fact that the bromination gave us 99% of the secondary um, alkyl bromide and only 1% of the primary alkyl bromide. In this case, where you have an early transition state, the difference between these two pathways is not that large. So uh, there is still a significant amount of the, of the substrate that goes essentially through the high or can go through the high energy process and gives you like a, four, uh, a 60 um, as, sorry, sorry, a 60, 40 distribution of, um, of, these, uh, of these two products. So this was about, um, I think we had 40% here and uh, we had 60% um, here. And on this side, we had the selectivity of this was 1% and this was 99% um, percent of the reaction. So, um, the key factor here is essentially that uh, in a laboratory setting, um, the brominations tend to be significantly more selective um, for the more stable um, uh, uh, carbon-based radical or favor the, state, the more stable carbon-based radical. So they are preferred um, over the chlorinations, which basically give you a much broader mixture um, um, of products that are less selective. On an industrial scale, however, um, chlorinations are usually the dominant species um, or, the, or the dominant reaction. Uh, you can easily handle um, uh, product mixtures like this through distillation on an, on, on an industrial scale. Uh, and it's made up fully by the chlorine gas being significantly cheaper than, um, than having to feed in uh, a bromine gas, um, which, is, uh, which is cost um, prohibitive, essentially. Um, just add here lower selectivity. Okay, so we'll end at that, this point here. Um, uh, on next Tuesday, we're gonna talk about a little bit more about radical brominations and how we perform radical brominations uh, in the laboratory. And, uh, and after that, uh, we are going to go a little bit into other radical reactions and uh, rearrangements um, that are initiated by radicals that form new carbon-carbon bonds. And that's essentially the last part um, um, of our, our lecture um, series uh, to um, the semester. Um, next Thursday, we're gonna have uh, the third midterm as uh, regularly announced. We'll come out later this week with, uh, with the instructions and the plan of how we proceed to go about this. But um, it's going to be structurally very similar, um, uh, a take-home exam, the same way we did uh, the, the second midterm um, just, uh, just before the spring break. Okay, so I'll be available for questions uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. again. Um, I will upload this lecture as soon as it has uh, rendered, and it will be in the same Dropbox as all the other lectures. Okay, so see you tomorrow or on Tuesday.